always hate to break up a great room of chatter. My name is Jonathan Weinhagen. and I'm president and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our annual breakfast with the mayors. On behalf of my colleague, B. Kyle, with the St. Paul Area Chamber, we're thrilled that all of you chose to join us this morning and spend a little bit of time hearing from our new mayors. Thanks. You know, I, I saw Mayor Carter when I rolled up um, first thing, and I said, Mayor, I promise I'm going to be brief. And he said, that's good. I'm going to try to be brief, too. So we kind of settled that early, and, which is a challenge for me. I'm an Irish Catholic attorney. It takes me 10 minutes to say hello, but I'm, I'm going to get this done real fast. Um, and then, uh, you know, I talked with, uh, with B. Kyle, and she said, you know, when you get up there, you got a couple minutes to pimp the saints a little bit and talk about the saints or whatever. And then I get the script. Jonathan, eight minutes. You just heard from Brianna. She's from over in Minneapolis. Ted Johnson gets five minutes. Minor league guy from St. Paul, two minutes. Hurry up and get the hell off the stage. So... I'm about to do that. But anyway, in, in my uh, remarks with, with Mayor Carter, I, I, is anybody who's maybe heard me talk before, I don't do well with prepared remarks. I, can't, I have a 15-second attention span. I do not stick to scripts well. Um, but I did want to give you all some background on the mayor and a few of the things that jump right off the page. I read kind of like I did in law school. You know, you just pick out the important words and then go with it. But um, he, he lives blocks from where he was raised. Ran track at Central High School, son of one of the first black cops in St. Paul. His mother is a Ramsey County commissioner. And there are other things about his education that I could go into and talk about a little bit. He had the good sense to get out of, out of here and go attend college in Florida, which I will give you props for, sir. Smart. Um, but all you need to know about Mayor Carter is how he ran his campaign. He ran it with with great dignity, passion, and a huge caring for our city. So I just, uh, I couldn't be more thrilled as uh, incoming, or I guess I'm current board chair, much to the chagrin of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. I could not be more thrilled, Mayor, uh, to have you as our mayor, and uh, come on up. Good morning. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm honored to, I'm always, it's always an honor to host the mayor of the second best city in the state. <laughs> Good to have you here, sir. Mayor Fry. Uh, I, I, I kid, we, 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 we enjoy kidding each other back and forth. Uh, about our cities, but I know we have a great uh, working relationship. I'm looking forward to continuing uh, that work forward. You know, a lot of what we're thinking about is, is thinking about our city a little bit different. Uh, I learned in the course of our campaign, uh, as I just kind of crisscrossed the city and chatted with folks, and uh, we, we started with this real simple question uh, that we called Imagine St. Paul. We started, I guess, two years ago, just bringing folks together and saying, what do you see when you look around your neighborhood? What do you see when you look around our city, uh, what, what do you see as the future? Like, wh why did you choose to plant your family or your, your business? Why are you invested in this place? And what do you see as the brightest future for our city? And, and one of the things that I learned really fast is that the people who are investing in our city, and when I say investing in our city, I mean business leaders, uh, and I mean those who have uh, entrusted us with their most precious uh, children. Uh, their kindergartners and their families uh, in our schools and in our recreation centers and our libraries. The people who are invested in St. Paul and in Minneapolis and in this Twin Cities region, they think a lot bigger than we dare to sometimes. They, their, their imagination, their vision for our community is a lot bigger. And so when we think about Minneapolis, our role with Minneapolis, a city that we've historically had some, it's fair to say, competition with, I think. Even that is thinking small. Our competition isn't Minneapolis. Our competition in the Twin Cities region uh, is London and is Paris. And Minneapolis isn't our competition. They're our best teammate. So 
So we talked a lot about unleashing the potential in our, in our city, unleashing the potential in our region, uh, unleashing the potential in the businesses and in the families and the children in our schools and the college students. How do we unleash the potential of this city? That's the question. And it's exciting to me because I think it's a little bit different. Because for a long time, I've seen the question about economic development be, how do we get somebody else to move here? How do we get somebody else to see potential in us and move here? Uh, we're asking the question, no, no, how do we identify the potential that exists in our city? How do we connect the businesses who are concerned about a workforce shortage with the unemployed people we have all over this city? How do we prepare people for the workforce? How do we make sure that our businesses can thrive? How do we make sure that, our, that, that, that we're building on our assets? And that's one of the things, the themes that came out as well. It started in a conversation about our river. You know, St. Paul has more frontage of Mississippi River than any city in America. And we were talking about the fact that we ought to be a river city. We ought to be planting our economy on the river. We ought to be using that as an economic engine in a way that we haven't. All that we've been doing for the last generation or so is building bridges to get over it. Treating it kind of like a problem to get over. And that got exciting because we started talking about our diversity in our community and how when we talk about diversity and, and, and the fact that we have this panorama, this spectrum of diversity in St. Paul, we talk about it as a challenge. We got to close the gaps. You know, but as long as we see that as a challenge, it'll keep us from identifying and opening up the doors to the global economy that ought to exist in a community as diverse as the Twin Cities. We talk about our schools, the fact that students in our public schools, and I see our partners in the St. Paul Public Schools, thank you so much for being here. Would you give them a round of applause for me? They work really hard. We talk about the 100 plus different languages that our students speak in our uh, St. Paul Public Schools, and we talk about it as a problem. We gotta teach those kids English. In the meantime, all of you and every company in the world right now has to find and tap into a multilingual workforce in order to compete in this global economy. We have a lot to work with, is my point. And I'm looking forward to, con to just pushing that work forward as mayor. We've elevated three central values. Uh, and this week we just announced, uh, or, or I guess last week we announced uh, these three core values that we're gonna really be focused on. Uh, that's equity. That starts with equity. We know in our community that we face some of the worst disparities in the nation. And that's unacceptable. In the Twin Cities, still, a child's life outcomes can be better predicted by her race and her zip code than they can by her work ethic. That's something that none of us should be able to live with. It's not fair to her, but it's also not sustainable for our region. That's not the path to our brightest, biggest, best future. We have to build the type of community where every child born in our community, every child born in our community has, can, can achieve her, 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 her highest potential. I'm committed to that. So our work on equity will focus on making sure that throughout the city's culture, throughout the city's workforce, throughout the city's, all of the work that we do, that we are committed to equity and providing fantastic public service to every person in every part of our city. That's value number one for us. Value number two for us is innovation. My, fr my good friend uh, and, and advisor, Scott Burns, tells me as a business leader, uh, you, you gotta work, not just work in the business, but work on the business. And we are focused to working on the business of city government and making sure that we are doing better. I've told all my department heads uh, that my question for you is gonna be, uh, who, who, who are we serving and how are we focused on getting better? And when we're done getting better, my question is gonna be, what are we doing to get even better? We've got to be focused on innovation and just getting better and better and better at what we do and working with our communities. This is, I know, the work that you do day in and day out. And our third val core value that we're lifting up is resilience. Because we know that it's no, matter, it's no longer a matter of trying to prevent climate change. Climate change is already here. And I know that personally because as we go about this work for all of these big things that we want to do in St. Paul, we're committed to uh, public safety and making sure that we all know that our officers and our neighbors are always on the same team. We're committed to creating the, uh, the brightest future for our St. Paul students and families. You know, we've put this bold vision out for, uh, to put $50 in the bank and college savings for every child born in this city. That's something that really excites me. 
that's something that really excites me uh, because, and, and when, when, we, when he announced it, folks looked at me and you know, I, there's folks all over this city who can't wait to run up on me and say, $50 isn't enough. $50 won't pay for books, it won't pay for college. You know how much college costs? And I say, you're right. $50 won't pay for college. There's a lot of research that does suggest that $50 is enough to inspire young children from low and moderate income families who might not otherwise think about college to see themselves in college. The research suggests that low and moderate income children who have between one and $400 put away for college are three times more likely to go. Are three times more likely to go to college. We can't afford not to do that. So I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to a robust conversation about our promise to raise the minimum wage in St. Paul. That's something that we have to do right for our city. And I'm looking forward to engaging with you directly as all of that works, moves forward. And as that work moves, and I guess I started on this path because I was talking about resilience and you're wondering what does that have to do with resilience. The point is, as we go about doing all of this big work, we also got to shovel snow when we get these extreme, uh, extreme weather events. And so that's why resilience has to be a focus of ours, knowing that everything that we're doing, we're doing it in a way that's planning for the future, in a way that is protecting our city and our children from the impacts of climate change. Uh, and that's work that we are committed to doing moving forward, uh, led by our chief resilience officer and former St. Paul, well, soon former, I don't know how to say it, soon former city council member, uh, council member Russ Stark, who's here in the audience today. It's good to see you. The final thing I'll say as I work, Tom, to try to shift the balance of time here toward, back towards St. Paul. <laughs> Thank you, that was generous. That was generous. Is, the question is how we do it. The question is how we do it. We're committed to not just doing different things, uh, but to doing things differently. And so we've launched Serve St. Paul because I think one of the biggest things that I learned and heard across this city uh, as people, you know, as, as engaged in this conversation, not just who should sit in the mayor's office, but what should the direction of our city be for the next four and eight years, is that there's an appetite to help. I, I think we have proven that the model of electing someone and coming back four years later to see what happened just doesn't work. And so we're committed to serve St. Paul. We're committed to asking people not to send me to City Hall, but to go there with me. Uh, we're committed to bringing people together. That work started with uh, our community hiring process that we brought over 100 people together uh, to select the department directors that would lead our city forward. That work continued through our inaugural week as we got fo as folks, I think over 100 people came together to help paint a mural with us at one of our recreation centers that came out really well. Uh, that work will continue uh, this week as we, you know, celebrate the big game here in, in the Twin Cities uh, with a family tailgate out at Jimmy Lee Recreation Center and a food drive uh, as well for families in our community. And that work will continue as we move forward. We're going to be asking you to come and help us. We're going to ask you to help us build this vision for our city. We're going to ask you to help us shape the best minimum wage ordinance that can move St. Paul forward. We're going to ask you to come help us read to children in our libraries and coach children in our rec centers, we need your help because we are building a city that works for everyone, and we have learned that building a city that works for everyone requires everyone to do the work. Thank you very much for your time. Wow. Tough to follow that, right? Uh, so I'm Ted Johnson. I am the board chair of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Uh, and Tom, this is my second time through this, and they beat all the improvis improvisation out of me, and uh, I will stick to script. Um, for the most part. I have to say, <laughs> Mayor Carter, well, I'm just telling you, it's been a topic at home. You did me no favors with your dance moves on inauguration night. I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain to my wife that my body just doesn't move like that. Uh, Mayor Fry, on the other hand, you've caused no such problems, so <laughs> thank you. I'm just saying. All right. 
Um, so the Timberwolves, you know, we went through a rebranding process, and uh, you know, as part of it, you you uh, you take a look at who you and what you are and, and who you are in the community, and and we developed an anthem, and we have this uh, great way that um, uh, I that we sort of discovered a great way to sort of describe that I've really sort of taken to our community, and we we talk about our community in terms of we are the last city of the east, the first city of the west, and the frozen capital of the north. And maybe this week we're the frozen capital of the bold north, right, Lester? And so we've heard from uh, the last city of the east, and it's time to hear from the first city of the west. And I'd like to set up uh, our mayor. In 2013, uh, Jacob Fry ran for city council in the third ward. And the third ward, for any of you involved with business and development, was an incredibly active ward during his term in office. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 all 65% of the growth in Minneapolis came out of the third ward. The third ward saw affordable housing uh, funded at record levels. They built a new award-winning community-based school. They had a record number of small business openings and made substantial improvements and enhancements to green space. Very active in your first term on the city council. And then, of course, as the mayor looks forward to his new role, Mayor Fry is focused on energizing every corner of every ward of the city. He works with citizens to make Minneapolis a city everyone can call home by focusing on issues, issues that affect people the most, such as affordable housing. He believes that Minneapolis should be a city that welcomes and cares for everyone, and his administration is focused on pursuing the fundamental goals of public safety, accountability, and trust within the community. Admirable goals. Uh, and so it is with that I'd like to introduce the 40th Mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry. Thank you, Ted. Uh, you know, and I'll have you know, little known fact, both of my parents were professional modern ballet dancers. <laughs> Dead serious. D you know, they danced for the Netherlands Dance Company, the Lubavitch Company in New York City, and you know, I was such a great dancer myself that I ended up becoming a politician instead. <laughs> uh, you know, thank you to the regional uh, chambers of Commerce, and thank you to St. Thomas for having us. Uh, Mayor Carter, that was an extraordinary speech. Uh, you know, a couple things. First, uh, on election night, the second thing that I thought of was, I hope Melvin wins. Uh, and we've had a, an important friendship for quite a long time, and now uh, a lot of people are talking about, oh, your colleague across the river. And I'll, I'll tell you what, it's better than a colleague across the river. For generations now, we talk about that city across the river as if, as if it's some sort of divisive thing. Uh, we talk about being in competition constantly, and while there is a friendly competition, we're also very much on the same side, both, both philosophically, theoretically, but also literally. For what I think is maybe only the second time in our Twin Cities histories, both mayors actually live on the same damn side of the river. I live in northeast Minneapolis, so this whole notion that we're somehow separated by the river, it's absolutely wrong. We are united by it. <laughs> and you know, uh, Mayor Carter, uh, he is... Uh, He's better looking than me. He is smarter than me. The only thing that I got going for me right now is that I get to be the mayor of the best city in our state, Minneapolis. <laughs> uh, but we have some tremendous opportunities right now. The gaze of the entire world has turned to Minneapolis and St. Paul. And as the world turns their gaze towards us, they're going to see a city united united around concepts of opportunity, of inclusivity, innovation, and justice. They're going to see two cities that aren't settling for being pretty good in the upper Midwest. As Mayor Carter says, we can be absolutely world class. We need to be, we need to believe it. We need to be living that mentality every single day because we absolutely are there. And so I had a long interview process to, to get this job, which, by the way, is my dream job. 
And during the course of that interview process, we talked to folks about the issues that they were facing in, the, in their communities. And there were several items that we wanted to you know, not just work on, not just talk about, not create a task force or have another meeting, but actually get very clear results on. We have some major, major issues that we need to be confronting right away. You know, the, the very first item on our agenda is going to be affordable housing. Uh, and I'll tell you why. We've lost in Minneapolis about 10,000 units of affordable housing in just the last 15 years alone. And it's not like things were rosy back in 2002. Uh, and I believe that we are at our best when we have 1,000 different backgrounds at the table, 1,000 different socioeconomic backgrounds, because that's when... That's when great ideas take shape. That's when entrepreneurship gets triggered. And that ultimately are when our cities are really going to rock. And so we need housing, not just at 50 and 60% of area median income, which is what we traditionally do with affordable housing, but also at 30% of area median income. Because here's the thing. We have a homeless population in Minneapolis. We have a homeless population in St. Paul. Uh, and they aren't able to grab that next rung on the ladder to pull themselves out to then build a foundation and build a brilliant life because they don't have that deeply affordable housing. Not only is that an immoral thing, it's, it's, it's also a, a socioeconomically and financially really bad decision. It costs about three times as much, three times as much to keep a person on the streets as homeless, cycling through hospital stay, sometimes jail, than it, than it does just to provide that next rung on the ladder, I think we have a moral obligation to do so. And here's the thing, our cities will ultimately benefit from it. You may have seen that just this last fall in 2017, we had 123,000 job vacancies. 123,000 job vacancies. That's a scary thought. That means that our economy is not continuing to grow, not, not because we don't have uh, innovation and, and business. It's, it's because we need the talented workforce to fill those jobs. And so we need to be accessing every single bit of talent that we have on the table in Minneapolis and St. Paul. We need to be making sure that kids growing up in North Minneapolis or the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul have every opportunity to succeed, to run with a great idea, and ultimately build a brilliant life. You know, sure, we didn't get Amazon, but I want the next Amazon to come right out of our region. Talk about uh, being a, a city that's built on a river. Think of the sites, think of the opportunities that we already have right here, from the Ford site in St. Paul to the post office in Minneapolis to the Upper Harbor Terminal in North. These are massive parcels that, by the way, have site control by the city that we can do something with. What about an iterative campus where we're making sure that that kid from Rondo neighborhood or North Minneapolis has the opportunities to move forward? We can do that. And so as we move forward, I think we need to be thinking about things differently. We need to move a little bit more out of the box. You know, the, the old model of the, you know, some of the massive square footage, multi-story department stores, uh, that model's dead. Whether we like it or not, I know there's a lot of nostalgia that's attached to Dayton's and maybe a little bit less so Macy's. Uh, but we can move beyond that. You know, now look at what's succeeding. Uh, look at what Target's doing. They're downsizing the square footage in their stores. And by the way, it's working. Look at some of the small local businesses that are succeeding right now. They're reducing the square footage on each one of their units. Uh, they're able to pay rent. And by the way, when you have multiple square storefronts with lesser square footage on every block, it creates a mentality in the street life that works. Suddenly, you walk down the street and you have a thousand different tastes and smells and sounds and people all packed in on the same block. That's what makes a city great. And we shouldn't be afraid to move in that direction. We also need to grow. I mentioned just a second ago, 123,000 job vacancies in the Twin Cities. We need to grow. We need to be looking beyond the boundaries of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul to attract additional talent from the coasts. You know, I didn't grow up here, and I actually think that's an okay thing. It's an okay thing to be welcoming in people from other areas, and grow we must. Not only is that important for our affordable housing crisis, we need additional supply to accommodate the demand that's coming in, uh, but we need to account for the workforce of the future. And by the way, by the year 2020, 
of the workforce is going to be millennials. I'll say that again. By the year 2020, 50% of the workforce is going to be millennials. And practically speaking, just so you know, that means that 50% of the workforce is either going to look, is going to look like Mayor Carter and I or substantially younger. <laughs> Perhaps that's a scary thought to some of you, but that is also a massive opportunity that we need to be accounting for. We need to be looking at what an uh, a, a millennial population is looking for in the workforce, in, in office space, in, in public realm improvements, in connection to the river. We also need to be what, uh, transforming Minneapolis and St. Paul to, to, to accommodate what they're looking for in, term, in terms of social justice as well. Uh, the second major issue that we're going to be focusing on is police and community relations. And the concepts of safety and police accountability, they are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are intrinsically linked. We're going to work to make sure that you get to know your police officer by name, narrowing beats so they're able to build out the positive relationships in the community that we all purport to want. This is not some like lofty goal that we have no chance of reaching. This is something that is entirely within our grasp, and we can most definitely get there. So as we look forward to the next step as we look to not be divided by a Mississippi River, but united by it. As we recognize that we are, in fact, a regional economy, and by the way, both mayors are entirely on the same page in this vision. We've got some great work ahead. And so I am so honored to be, well, not your mayor, I guess, but the mayor from across the, from down the river. <laughs> Uh, and I can't wait to get to work with all of you. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is B. Kyle. I'm in the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, mayors, for joining us this morning. And look at all these beautiful people in the room. It's truly extraordinary how this room was filled with folks who have lots of things to do and lots of places to go. And each one of you chose to be here to listen to the future, to hear about possibility, to talk about opportunity. And we're so grateful that you're choosing to lead us down that path. Uh, I, I don't have any prepared remarks today, but I just wanted to assure those of you who don't know me and those of you who don't know Jonathan Weinhagen, that we, we believe that now is our time, that St. Paul and Minneapolis compete together. Though I tell you, Jonathan, if we had a dance-off, I would win, <laughs> but that's an aside. That we know that now is our time, and we believe that you know it too, and we've got two mayors with exciting opportunities and vision for where we need to go. So thank you for taking your time. What we want to invite you in as well into the conversation in that if you have passion, if you've got something really exciting going on and you're not at the table yet, we are casting a wider net and we're asking you to join us to be a part of the dream that's possible and work together towards a very exciting future. So thank you again for coming. Uh, and before we close, though, I do want to open it for questions. So for either of the mayors, if you'd be willing to join me on here on stage, I'll come into the audience, and then Amanda will be over on my left here to. So if you'd let me know you have a question, we'll come to you with a microphone. Good morning. Um, I was wondering if each of the mayors could talk a little bit about your transportation priorities, particularly on the public transportation side, because we know that's a really important topic to the future uh, working population, millennium, and uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, public transportation, I mean, is critical for purposes of equity, it's critical for purposes of business, and it's without a doubt an item that we all should be united around whether it's going to the state legislature, lobbying the city council or the county or the metropolitan council, this is an issue that's absolutely critical. And the reality is, is that you know, we collectively are, are kind of far behind 
Um, yes, we need to be building out light rail. Yes, we need to be looking at additional and, and innovative transportation options. Um, something that I think is often overlooked is, is bus rapid transit, uh, is BRT. And, and right now in Minneapolis, uh, we have lines that are very slowly moving forward, uh, but are absolutely critical to our overall city's infrastructure and our social infrastructure as well. You know, you can't expect somebody to take on a job that they can't get to. Uh, and that's a major problem right now. Many people don't have that ability. Um, so expanding BRT service, uh, working with some of the other uh, different jurisdictions in the area, uh, and, and also kind of moving away from the not in my backyard mentality that it, sometimes we, we, f we fall victim to. Um, so there are some substantial opportunities there, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Mayor Carter. So you want to add sure. anything? Sure. The question is uh, really core to why I started in politics in the first place. You know, 10 years ago, we as a community were looking at building a, a light rail line on University Avenue, and we were going to build it at one point in time in a way that actually hopscotched the neighborhood that I once represented on the city council. Uh, and, and that wasn't acceptable. I, I felt like it's critical to have transit. Back then, we talked a lot about the way you can look at a map now of the United States and see the places where the railroad tracks went, right? Because that's where economic activity is concentrated. Uh, and the same patterns are presenting themselves right now. Uh, as we talked about uh, where, how we position St. Paul and the Twin Cities for the best future, it, it's intriguing because you're right. We have kind of a, 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 a fear around transit. Uh, we have a fear around b bike lanes. We have a fear around some of these things that uh, I believe are going to be some of the most important things my children and our children look for when they decide where to plant their businesses. And so, you know, having that, uh, th that investment, I think, is absolutely critical. Right now in St. Paul, we have p parts of our city on the east side and on the west side that you can drive downtown in five minutes, but it takes 30 or 40 minutes to get to on transit. That is a jobs op problem. That is an economic development problem for our city. Uh, so our, our first priority is going to be focused on uh, getting a uh, Riverview Corridor done uh, to connect downtown St. Paul uh, to the airport by rail. That's something that's going to be important, I think, for our entire metro area, uh, making sure that our, uh, as we build out bus rapid transit, uh, that we're building that kind of transit system that's not sort of the, the plan B for people who don't have a car, uh, but really understanding that as, you know, as Mayor Fry was talking about the millennials uh, who are an increasing percentage of our workforce, uh, there are more and more people who, who would prefer to be on high quality transit uh, than to be uh, uh, in a car, and, and we have to accommodate those folks. Um, so for me, it's about building that rail. It's about um, making sure that our just regular bus service is connected to our whole city and serving our whole city well. Uh, and even beyond that, it's really not about transit as as much as it's about moving people across our city. So that connects our complete streets strategy, which means transit, bikes, pedestrian friendly, and a city that's great for cars. Well, we have a question over here. Good morning. My question is uh, for both of you on the urban rural divide, where we have Minneapolis and St. Paul, a strong Minneapolis St. Paul means a strong greater Minnesota and vice versa. But we have 45% of our folks who live outside the metro who don't see themselves in the metro conversation anymore. My question is for both of you is, what role does St. Paul play, Minneapolis and St. Paul play in helping bridge that divide? Uh, maybe I'll take this one first. Um, I appreciate the question. You know, I think there's a whole lot of things that somewhat artificially divide us. Uh, there's the St. Paul Minneapolis divide. There's the progressive conservative divide. Uh, there's the uh, equity versus growth divide. Uh, there's the Democrat versus Republican divide. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're, we've got so many divides that it, it becomes impossible to work together. In my previous role, I worked for the governor. And I worked as the executive director of the Minnesota Children's Cabinet, and I got a chance to just, you know, spend, I called it windshield time, you know, getting across the state. Uh, and I had a visit up to Thief River Falls, which is about as great a greater Minnesota you can get to, right? <laughs> uh, and I was up there, and they said, well, let me show you what happens in, in, in greater Minnesota. Some of our families face deep poverty and can't afford you know, to, to, to put food on the table or just a place to live with their children. And so they're living in substandard kind of uh, environments. And I went, oh, I get that. 
And they said, well, and, and, and some families have trouble uh, getting access to, you know, child care. And so, you know, child care might be far away or, you know, being able to find child care that they can afford and that is quality for their children might be really difficult for families. And I said, well, well I get that, too. And one of the incredible things that I've learned as someone who has spent time in greater Minnesota and who has done those site visits and who has talked to the folks who are doing the work in greater Minnesota is the extent to which uh, that divide is created in our heads. That the, 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 and, and, and in many ways, there, there are ways that, you know, the, the specifics of how a lot of these issues, uh, how, how they manifest themselves might be different a, a little bit within the cities as opposed to in greater Minnesota. But a lot of the issues that we're facing are uh, very similar. And so, you know, our focus is going to be to focus on people, to focus on saying, you know, we're, we're talking about a city that works for all of us. Uh, I don't remember exactly what, your, what the phrase is that you use, but it's essentially the same thing. I heard you say, you know, every child in every corner of the city. Now, and that has to be true for the state as well. Uh, and so, you know, I, I know that both Mayor Fry and I have already spent time with mayors across our region and mayors across our state, uh, with legislators across our region and legislators across our state. And I think that we have to, every, every given point we can in the, com in, the, in the press and at the Capitol, just reject the notion that it's cities or greater Minnesota. It's cities and greater Minnesota. I think Mayor Carter just hit the nail on the head. Uh, and, and my message is the exact same in that there, there is far more that unites us in our state than divides us. Um, one of the first things that I did after uh, getting elected as mayor was uh, setting up a, a chief of staff, hiring a chief of staff. Uh, and the chief of staff that I chose to hire uh, was a state legislator, former state legislator from Crosby, Minnesota. Um, and there were two reasons that we did that. One, he's incredibly talented. Uh, but two, I wanted to signal that Minneapolis is not operating in a vacuum. We're operating not just in a regional economy, but in, in a statewide economy. And as Mayor Carter correctly pointed out, many of the issues that we're dealing with in Minneapolis are being dealt with throughout the state. Crosby, by the way, is, the, I believe, the poorest area of the entire state. Um, I mean, people are struggling. Uh, there are issues with public education and, and road and transportation infrastructure, uh, people are pre in pretty significant poverty. And we have many of the same issues in our Twin Cities as well. Uh, and so, you know, as we look to the future, uh, I think there are far more areas where we can cross-collaborate than we're divided on. Uh, you know, issues like local government aid, you know, and oftentimes Minneapolis and St. Paul have gotten the short end of the stick. Uh, and that doesn't need to be the case because the reality is, is we in the Twin Cities are producing a whole lot of the revenue that is then properly so dished out to other areas of our region and state. Um, and so I, I echo the words that Mayor Carter just said. Question over here. Hi, this uh, question is uh, directed at Mayor Carter, but it can apply to both mayors. As a resident of St. Paul, I'm really excited about the big economic development project, which is Alliance Field and the, the soccer stadium. I'm a big soccer guy, and I love it. And I'm supportive of it. But how can we also bring awareness to other great things? Right down the road, Gordon Parks High School uh, in St. Paul is just doing amazing things as an alternative high school. And I bet most of the people in this room, at least the Minneapolis side, isn't aware of Gordon Parks, but they're aware of the soccer stadium. How do we, and that concept can apply in Minneapolis as well, how do you bridge the gap to support large scale economic projects, but also focus on the grassroots aspects of each of our cities? Um, it's an important question, you know, because as we think about city building, uh, the question is what does that mean? And so, you know, some, our, our former deputy mayor, uh, Kristen Beckman, actually did me a favor. Uh, when I first got elected, she looked at me and she said, are you going to rearrange the furniture in the mayor's office? And it was weird to me because I've been around that office for uh, the last 15, 20 years, and it's always been the same. And it actually didn't occur to me that you could move the desk. <laughs> <laughs> And it helps me realize that we can rephrase, reframe all of the questions and ask the questions differently. We don't even have to look at the challenges in the same way. And so you're right. We have, and not just, not just soccer, we have an incredible set, and, and, and Mayor Fry alluded to it earlier, uh, we have an incredible set of opportunities in front of our city right now. 
uh, between, you know, in front of our whole community right now, uh, between soccer, between the Ford plant, between uh, uh, Treasure Island Center and in, uh, in, in downtown. We have a lot of opportunity. The Osborne 370 building, I'm excited about a lot of things. When I got on the campaign, I was, uh, I remember saying, that, you know, we to question after question, I'd go, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for our city. It started to feel cliche, because I was saying it so much about all these different things that are going on in the city. Uh, at the same time, though, as we talk about identifying the potential that we miss, right? That, that potential isn't really always about the big, shiny object. It's about really saying, how do we really kind of stir up the potential that exists all throughout our city? And so one of the things that we're committed to, uh, and we're gonna be bringing this out more and more uh, moving forward, uh, is really focusing on our neighborhood commercial corridors. Uh, we have neighborhood commercial corridors all, of our, all over our city, which have some really incredible character, in, in, incredible culture uh, that I believe uh, are, are, are part of a key to kind of getting people across neighborhoods, to getting more people to come into St. Paul for a wire, wider variety of things, and to really creating jobs and economic opportunity in some of the places that we need it, in some of the neighborhoods and communities that we need it the most. So that's something that we're going to be kind of moving forward with. Uh, I don't know if you saw who we hired as our director of our plan Department of Planning and Economic Development, uh, which is uh, Dr. Bruce Corey, who has been a leader uh, over the last 20 years in terms of research about the um, economic potential, in particularly of our uh, communities of color and ethnic uh, communities in, this, in the cities. Uh, so that's a strategy we're going to be all in on very soon. Well, I see two important issues here. The first is we do need to be focusing on our cultural corridors that have traditionally le been left behind in Minneapolis, and one of them is East Lake Street. Another one is Broadway in North Minneapolis. Uh, and by the way, I'm proud to be joined here today by council members Kano and Jenkins, who represent areas surrounding uh, the East Lake Street area. Uh, and the second big thing is we've got to move away from the traditional mentality of you know, just offer a gigantic corporate subsidy and wipe your hands clean and call it a day. Uh, you know, we, we were looking at Amazon a little bit ago. Um, and the, the concepts of kind of growth and equity and inclusivity, they're not mutually exclusive concepts. Uh, we can kind of do some outside of the box thinking in Minneapolis and how we recruit and retain some of these significant entities. Uh, you know, I strongly believed in, in looking at some form of, of iterative campus. Uh, you know, I mentioned just a little bit ago, looking at, you know, the Ford site, what a tremendous opportunity there, and, and Mayor Carter's got an amazing vision for it. But what if you were to combine the, you know, the Ford site as an attraction, along with that downtown post office, you knock out the parking ramp, you have a beautiful cascading entrance into the river, you have some sort of market space at the base, uh, and then move up a little bit further to North Minneapolis and the Upper Harbor Terminal. This is like a massive plot of land, and we always talk about triggering jobs for communities in impacted areas uh, and communities of color. Well, this is a great opportunity to do it. What if we were to have a jobs training program and they could do a direct pipeline to someone who's graduating with, say, the knowledge of coding. They get that coding uh, they, and then they transition directly into a well-paying job. So we can simultaneously attract significant investments and invest in our community at the same time. It doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. These concepts can be one and the same. All Looks right. like we have one final question. Hi, um, my name is Pashi. I am the uh, one of a uh, community organizer for Asian American Organizing Project. Um, we're here today to ask you both, um, Melvin Carter, you had mentioned defending uh, St. Paul's status as a sanctuary city, uh, and Jacob uh, Fry, you also mentioned Minneapolis as a separation ordinance. Uh, we just want to see, can you both elaborate on it, on like, you know, the sanctuary city and uh, separation ordinance um, in, the, in the terms of what communities should be aware of, and can you confirm with us uh, what you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul is, is it like a sanctuary city, um, a separation ordinance, is it a place of protection um, to keeping our, you know, families and our community uh, safe from, you know, deep, for the, from the risk of deportation? Mm -hmm. then, then do you want to add something? We need, okay. so I'll start out by saying, uh, I'll start out by sharing a mentality that I think we all need to share. We need to stand up for our immigrant, our non-documented community, uh, who, by the way, are our neighbors, period. Uh, there's no wavering. There's no fluctuation. We need to stand up for them because you know, not only is this the moral and righteous thing to do, but the reality is, is that Minneapolis and St. Paul would be 
actually losing population as an entire region if it weren't for our immigrant community. Um, it, it, they are critical. I mean, these are these are the best entrepreneurs and artists and and creators and CEOs, by the way, that we have to offer, um, and we need to be standing by them 100% of the time. Uh, now, secondly. So in Minneapolis, we have, as you mentioned, a separation ordinance. And there's a lot of talk about kind of a, a sanctuary city. Um, and, you know, our, uh, Donald Trump uh, issued an executive order saying that he was going to deprive all sanctuary cities of federal funding. Interestingly, there's no definition of what constitutes a sanctuary city. As I said, you know, we, we might be one, we might not be one. It depends on the definition. What we do have, as you stated, is a separation ordinance. And that ordinance says that our cops and our public officials are not to ask the question as to whether uh, an individual is documented or not. And because we haven't asked the question, we haven't gathered any information. And because we haven't gathered any information, when Donald Trump says, give us all your information or else you're deprived of federal funds, our first response is quite simply, we don't have any. We don't have any information. We're not handing it over. Uh, because we're standing up for our neighbors. I mean, this is a critical value. I think we all in this community need to be sharing. This is... This is good morals, this is good business, this is good for our entire region. Uh, it is, and I, I, I appreciate you saying that and, and fully and wholeheartedly agree. Um, you may have heard this past summer my house got broken into. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my neighbor, who saw somebody breaking into my back door, uh, called me right away. Uh, he didn't call 911, he called me. And I asked him later, why didn't you just call 911? And he said, well, you know, I wasn't sure if it was a friend of yours or somebody coming to feed your dog or something like that. I, I, just, I just didn't want to call 911. And it occurs to me that when we talk about being a city that works for everyone, when we talk about making sure that all of our neighbors feel comfortable calling the police, that all of our neighbors feel comfortable calling for help when they need it, that all of our neighbors know that our city services and our public services are there to serve, help, to lift, and to help them have a successful life. We don't just do it for them. We're all better off mm -hmm. when all of us know that these services are for all of us. When all of us feel comfortable calling 911 or calling for help, uh, we're all better off. If your neighbor doesn't feel comfortable calling for the police or calling the fire department, if your house has smoke coming out of it, you're worse off. And so our focus on being a sanctuary city and protecting all of our neighbors and serving all of our neighbors uh, isn't just something we're doing for them. It's something we're do we have to do for all of us. And so to me, there's, I'm, I'm a person of faith, and there's two aspects of sanctuary. There's protection, there's the covering. And we have to know that our police officers, as Mayor Fry just said, will never, ever, ever ask about uh, citizenship status. Mm -hmm. And just having that as a policy is not enough. I'm committed, and our police chief, uh, Todd Axtell, who's a great chief, uh, is committed to doing it with me, being in community every chance we get and making sure that people know that that's the case, that this is your police department that this is your fire department, this is literally your city, you help us pay the rent here. Um, so there's the protection component, but then there's also the uh, promise component. And so to me, part of that question has to be not just you know, do, do our officers ask about citizenship status or not, but it has to be, can, can, can people find a great education for their children in our schools? Can people open a business and find the promise of entrepreneurship? Can right. people access affordable quality housing? Can people access a high quality way of life? Those to me are the two components of being a city that provides sanctuary for all of us, and those are two things that I'm very committed to. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I just want to say it's been an honor, uh, Mayor Fry. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to us uh, uh, continuing to lead this community together. 
Uh, and, and I know that I speak on both of our behalf when I say uh, that having a strong business community uh, to work with uh, is an asset for our whole community, uh, that I'm proud of the roles that our chambers play uh, in the process of city building. Uh, and you know, I've gotten a chance to know uh, B. Kyle uh, quite a bit. Uh, I definitely know Jonathan. Uh, I don't see where he went, but I know he's in the room here somewhere. Um, and it's just an honor to know that as we talk about building a city that works for all of us, uh, that we have a strong partner in our business community, that we have two strong partners uh, in our business community. Uh, so thank you so much for all of your service to this community, to this region. We're all better for it. Thank you. Obviously, there's a whole lot of unity in the room right now, and we all need to be coming together in a major way. I'll just uh, leave it with one last uh, bit of sentiment. So the other day, uh, Mayor Carter and I uh, had the honor of attending uh, a, a ceremony with the Hmong and Laos community. Uh, and what they, it, it was one of the most amazing and heartwarming things. You know, the whole community, they come up, and you know, they, they have a, a hard-boiled egg in one hand, some fruit, and then they put these bracelets, these string bracelets on your, your arm, and they tie them. And as they're tying them, uh, they'll sort of give you some a prayer and perhaps some words of wisdom. Now, after it was over, Mayor Carter and I exchanged bracelets in, as well. Um, and I'm still wearing one of them. Uh, and one of the things that we said to each other was this notion of, of looking beyond what we presently are. Um, not just being pretty good in the upper Midwest, but being world class. Uh, it's a sentiment we share, and it's a sentiment that with all of your help, we can absolutely do. So I think we're both very much looking forward to working with you. <laughs>